Um, so let me just end that part. That's sort of how I kind of feel like I'm living the world of credibility and reputation and trying to build the agency's credibility. Let me just switch to a couple thoughts on the book. I found it very helpful in terms of understanding some things I didn't understand at FDA, uh, why so much. And just a few of those would be um, that individuals matter a lot. And you don't really appreciate that, why that's so much the case. Like you just think, like, well, this is one person making noise about this. But we have a whole agency, and all these other people may disagree. Why are people so focused on one person? And that's kind of hard to understand. But if you sort of set it in the narrative that one of the ways that the agency's reputation has been built over the years are about stories of scientists really standing in for the agency, you know, and how important um, their work are, that they're individual heroes. You kind of see that that narrative is just sort of part of the way people think about FDA, and so I, I thought that was very helpful. Um, I also didn't quite understand as why people were very, uh, you know, very focused on the reputations of companies and others who intersect with FDA. So currently, there's just a huge amount being written about um, what the how a particular company handled a particular drug called Avandia. And you know, there's congressional investigations about it, there's newspaper stories about it. And you know, part of you says, well, okay, I mean you've got the behavior of the company, but like there's data. Why don't we base our decisions based on the data? Why so much about the company? But I think kind of in the context of how much um, how FDA's reputation developed in part in relation to the industry and how the agency really um, pulled up the reputation industry at different times, it, it, I think it's helped me kind of put it in a better context. Um, it also helps me explain something, a phenomenon that I've noticed at, at FDA, which I will summarize by saying, if we explain the public health value of an issue before we regulate, we win. If we're regulating at the same time, we're explaining the public health value of an issue, not so sure. Okay. So what I mean is, if, if, if we can get out and say, FDA really believes this is the right thing to do, and here's why, we can, you know, build an alliance, we put that out. Everybody focuses on the merits of what we're talking about. But if it's um, at the same time that we're taking something away from someone in the regulatory process, people can focus just an enormous amount on that. So we announced, for example, about uh, oysters, that we thought that uh, there were certain raw oysters in certain months on the Gulf Coast that were, um, uh, had a pretty serious danger. At the same time, we talked about how we might regulate them, and people really focused on the small oyster producers and the restaurants and not about how reasonable we'd be in putting in place rules about that. And it was a very complicated conversation to have at the time. I think that um, we, um, putting it a little bit in context, I think that we leverage our reputation and credibility better when we can just talk from that first. I think that's why it's more effective that way, that people really want to hear from you and see what we believe and why, and then they can turn their you know, attention to whether we're doing it fairly or reasonably or not. But if you try to mix those two together, you're not really getting the full benefit of our reputation and credibility. Two last points. Um, if I were to make a criticism of the book, I would say that I think it, it, in some cases it might view things as a little static. But like, you know, because of this dynamic, FDA never wants to revisit decisions, for example. This is why FDA doesn't want to revisit decisions, but I think that you can accept the premise of the book and the importance of reputation and credibility and see it as, as that, it, that there's a little bit of a cycle that FDA may for a while be in a position of never revisiting its decisions and refusing to talk about its past decisions again and again and again, and at a certain point that might start to damage its credibility, you know, and its reputation. If you look at the region case and the um, the knee implement that I was talking about before, I think that might have been that kind of situation. In fact, actually doing an assessment, finding that there were serious flaws to the process, deciding to re-review the product, was not a huge hit to our credibility. In fact, we got editorials and other things saying, you know, FDA is sort of uh, showing some signs of life, I think is what the New York Times said, and, you know, that we're willing to take on something like that. So I think that, you know, you can, different types of behavior can still be explained by the same underlying process if you think of it as a little bit of a cycle. The other one is, I think, about vagueness versus transparency. I think that for a while, vagueness works in regulatory decisions. You know, just send another application, we'll tell you whether you made it or not, and that's really described in the book. Um, and that may work for a while, and it certainly is a very way of, of um, developing power. But at a certain point, people get very angry about that, and they don't know what the rules are, and they get upset that their products aren't approved, and then you're 
you're vulnerable, you know, to the charge that you're just holding things up in your big bureaucracy, like what happened um, around some cancer and AIDS treatments, and then you get pressure in the other direction. And I think that I think that we're kind of at a stage of the cycle where more transparency will help the agency's reputation, less vagueness, um, more understanding of what the FDA does um, will be helpful. And so I think that you can accept the premise of the book and, and fit some things that might not seem to fit in there if you understand that we're really trying to, to do things differently in some cases in order to build our, our reputation and, and what I would call credibility. The last thing I'd say is definitely the point about lawyers is extremely important. And I, I think that um, uh, Dr. Hambert actually gave a very interesting speech about um, how she sees law fitting into the FDA um, now. I would just say that you may or may not be aware that there's a pretty serious uh, legal challenge going on to FDA's authority, which is really important to put in the context of this book. Um, there are a couple companies, um, one a drug company and then a number of tobacco companies that are really challenging the idea that FDA should be reviewing things prior to marketing, reviewing claims prior to marketing, reviewing uh, products prior to marketing. Um, um, that the legal basis is commercial free speech um, argument um, that really is a uh, pretty a historical, I would say, and it's very interesting to, to realize that these are not kind of the issues, and that um, it may be that FDA finds itself in a position to really have to go back and justify some of the things that were really established over this period. Uh, and I'll just um, mention that um, I was I actually went to the oral argument in Kentucky for this tobacco case, and uh, where FDA is being challenged because we're saying you can't market a cigarette and claim that it's safer without getting approval of the FDA. For whatever particular claim that you want to make, and the uh, Justice Department got up and argued, well, um, you know, they're not doing anything differently than what they do for drugs. Everybody knows you can't make a claim about a drug unless FDA is determined not to be accurate. And the and in fact, the uh, in this sort of circuit, there was a case about someone arguing that honey cured cancer, and FDA shut them down because they didn't approve that honey cured cancer. And the lawyers on the other side got up and said. It's just really, you know, embarrassing for the government that they're relying on their patently unconstitutional system of drug approval to try to make a case in the back of the case. And that uh, the only reason that uh, Honey uh, case turned out the way it did was because it was before the doctor made commercial free speech. So this is, you know, a lot of these things are, are, are extremely important. This is the kind of um, book that uh, I think um, is not just a history book. So I really appreciate it. That's why I flew up here. I was really excited by it. And I really do thank uh, Professor Carpenter.